Welcome to the fifth annual Mustard Seed Project Collaborative. This year, the theme is shared experiences. Uh, we are currently in a bit of a confusing time uh, coming out of a pandemic. Um, I don't know if it's over. Um, some people say it is, some people say it's not. But one thing that I do know is that it's been a couple, couple tough years. And so I thought this would be a good time to reflect on the experiences that we've had as part of uh, MSP. Uh, please be yourself if you're just joining. Um, and so I thought it would be, like I said, a good time to reflect on those experiences. Um, to start off, I'll give the floor to our chair, Lin Lin, for some opening words. Let me see if I can share the screen so it can be a little nicer. Tell me when you can see it. Oh, I press share. That is not the right one. Let me know when you can see it. Thumbs up. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Erica and as Felipe said, I go by Lin, Lin since we have three Erica's on leadership team for some reason, it gets a little confusing when we're talking. Um, but anyways, I'm lucky enough to serve as your chair for the 2022 to 2023 term. So first off, just wanna say thank you all for coming out on this fine Saturday. I'm excited for the school year to start and it started for some of you, um, mainly because I don't have to deal with homework and studying anymore, but also more importantly, because you know I get to watch all of you all of the chapters, the volunteers, and the people that are affected by and affect our project, you know, do what they do best, and that's serve, innovate, and grow. So while I like to think that each person is unique, I know that my many experiences with MSP, as well as many people here, have been filled with moments, values, and thoughts that you all resonate and share with, at least at like some point, if not already. And um, it is the shared drive, the shared values, and the shared experiences that truly just bring us together. So with that, I kind of wanted to go over like, you know, when I joined MSP in 2018, I started as this now defunct research chair position. I had never been on outreach before, like here's some surveys and stuff. My only previous exposure to those who were homeless was pretty much watching from afar. I had grown up in the Bay Area which had and still has a notoriously large population of unhoused individuals. And I'd never talked to anyone like that. I'd never interacted with anyone like that and, or even made eye contact. Um, so to say that I was scared to kind of start leading outreaches and just go on my very first one is pretty accurate. Um, I remember it was a Sunday, it was just Martin or some of you may know him as Christian and I, and, we had waters and sur a survey. So these are some examples of the surveys that we made because at the time this research chair position was trying to conduct some sort of social science research. And while neither of us are really social science majors, it kind of we kind of failed to make anything much of it, but you know, it's all a part of the process of trying things and learning from them and growing and iterating with our services and things like that. Um, but with that distinct experience, you know, I, I definitely remember shaking and being anxious and having Martin quickly debrief me on the basic protocols that kind of predated Air Street. And then we just went out with our materials and ourselves, our stories and talking. And the rest of it was pretty much almost like a blur. But what I do remember even to this day is just at the end, sitting in the car, almost feeling like this rush, this, this interest, this everything. Because prior to that, right before that experience, I was just freaking out. I was thinking like, how do you how do you talk to someone that's homeless? I was overthinking. What if I offend someone? What if what if something scary happens? Something like that. And at the end of the day, you, you, I came to realize, you know, how do you talk to someone that's homeless? How do you how do you work with people in those situations? And it's just like, how do you talk to some someone in general? How do you work with someone in general? Because everyone is a person. We're all people. And so, you know, from there, uh, got to go out every Sunday and do outreach with with this was like kind of the main group that ended up coming out recurringly for me um we all got to get pretty close had hangouts here or there made made peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and quesadillas before outreaches and things like that and it was a good time it was fun and you know we got to learn about each other as well as the people that we met um and so you know from there my time with msp and undergrad was was filled with study sessions 
board meetings in a study room or a library, late night adventures. A lot of these photos are really bad quality. That's just because I dug through like old, really like, you know, college photos of just like, oh, we're just going to quickly snap this. Let's go for it. So they're not professional, but I think that makes that adds a little charm. Um, but yeah, no, it was just like dealing with those late night adventures, care package creations, struggles with coordinating rides, familiar faces on outreach, painful stories on outreach, and hopeful stories on outreach, uh, social events at the beach, lifelong friendships and adventures, trialing new ideas that led to many failures and some successes, fundraisers, air drives, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, being a part of MSP for so long, I've been able to kind of watch it grow. And it, it's truly been an amazing experience. And one thing that I think is super awesome, for example, is the whole service navigation program. We have a few service navigators out today, and I've gotten to talk and work with a lot of them. And it's, it's, it's something that wasn't there when I joined MSP and to see how that program has developed and shaped as and taken and taken form is, is, is something truly spectacular. It's just like an example of how we just keep constantly growing. And I love, I love to see things like that happen. So with that, you know, as chair, I kind of have a focus, a few focuses for this year. And the first two I think are pretty self-explanatory, you know, high quality services. We have this whole thing where, you know, we want low barrier, but high quality service, high quality volunteers, all of that. So it's just maintaining that, iterating upon it, making it better and improving. Uh, the second one is setting up sustainable systems where it's, you know, a lot of what we try to do is not only think about and work with um, the short term, but also the long term. How can we create long term solutions? How can we make what we do very sustainable so that it's not just like a one and one and done little short quick thing and it's and it's really trying to create that long lasting impact and change and the one that i wanted to highlight the most was the, the bottom one was grow grow up grow out and grow together grow up as in mature and learn from our mistakes and go from that you know whether that be organizationally as well as personally because i do believe that i grew a lot as a person just my time in MSP, as well as just watching the organization grow, right? Growing out, that's that's spreading our influence, our increasing chapters, gaining new volunteers, building our community, increasing like uh, the, the amount of people that we can serve. And finally, and the most important part that I think is growing together. That's fostering that sense of community through shared values, shared drive, and shared experience like today. Um, from time to time, you know, I love to reflect and look back at where I started with MSP to where I am now with it. It has given me so much and I know it will do the same for you all, if not already. So with that being said, I encourage you to open your ears, your hearts and yourselves, and share your life and your experiences with this project and the people you've interacted with because of it. Not just today, but each day in the future as well. And so with that, I thank you all for coming out. Thank you, Felipe, for setting up setting a lot of this up, putting it into motion. And thank you, Levi, for coming out. I want to hand this over to Levi for a special guest speaker today. All right. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I love MSP and everything that you guys are doing just to bridge the gaps and um, miss, you know, communications and just um, the acknowledgement of, of growth that you guys are committed to is uh, inspiring. So, um, thank you for having me. Um, some of you may know a little bit of my story before, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit how I became homeless, um, how I got out of it. Um, but the main thing that I was, I felt compelled to teach you guys today was a specific lesson that I learned in the process of like my recovery and becoming stabilized. Um, and I'll tell you at the beginning, but it is, it is the way that I learned this lesson that, that, uh, I think resonates the most. So, um, the lesson is to spot the similarities and not the differences in people. Um, so, uh, I was born in Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, I had a single mom and a little brother. Um, for the most part, like we were raised like pretty well um 
But uh, we, uh, we ended up moving um, when I was about 11 to Pennsylvania. And that was kind of a big culture shock because prior to that, my uh, whole community had been like, you know, a very beach community and um, it didn't snow in Mississippi or anything like that. So middle school, uh, my mom got remarried. Uh, we moved up to a colder climate. Um, it was a very small town and um, it was not necessarily uh, a place for LGBT people. It was always kind of taught or like preached that like California was like this ut utopia um, for people who were LGBT. And so um, early on, I kind of set my sights on getting out to California um, at whatever cost. I lived in Brooklyn a little bit also, um, but California ultimately, uh, when I got here, it felt more like the type of community that I had really longed for where like, um, my sexuality wasn't like placed above just getting to know me as a person. and um, I did like the weather. Um, I was working for a long time. I was working a lot. I was working like 60 hours, 60 hour week, 60, yeah, 60 hours a week. And um, just trying to pay rent. Um, that started getting more and more difficult at one point. Like I moved into a cheaper place, uh, but I was constantly getting tickets for driving uh you know, my car either on the phone with a boss or uh, didn't stop long enough at a light. I was very young, 19. And so um, those were very expensive lessons to learn was getting all those tickets. So at one point I decided, okay, uh, I'm gonna move into my car and I'm gonna pay these tickets. And um, it just got worse from there. So, um, uh, Eventually, um, I didn't even have my car anymore. Um, and so at that point, I tried to kind of humble myself. And I thought, I'll go back to Mississippi for a little bit. Um, I ended up working a ton there, but still, uh, because the minimum wage was lower there, I still couldn't afford a place there. So I was living in the back of the gym that I was managing. And um, it got like real rough when it would rain. It would like, the rain would come in under the door and um, it had roaches really bad. Um, and I kept still wanting to get back out to California. So I did end up back out in California again, um, ended up homeless again, but this time on Venice Beach Boardwalk. And um, it was at that point that I felt like, not necessarily that I had burned uh, all of my bridges, but I didn't have anybody else that I could call and ask for favors. There was no more couches that I could stay on. There was, um, you know, nobody else that I could borrow money from. And I had just, I slipped into this depression and had just as well like assumed that my ultimate destiny was that I was just gonna die on the beach. And um, for months I would just lay there in the direct sunlight and my black hoodie and black sweatpants and just, I had just given up. I was completely broken down. So um, I would get lots of tickets uh, for uh, crimes of homelessness. Uh, like at that time, uh, one was called uh, obstructing a sidewalk, which just made it sound like I was like taking up a whole, whole sidewalk, but it was, uh, this was even like before tents and anything. So, um, it would literally just be if you were like loitering or standing on a sidewalk and they didn't want you there, but, um, and those would rack up and stuff. And so I'd have to go do like a few days in jail here and there. Um, but ultimately, even though I was homeless, the community that was around me didn't care that I was LGBT. There was a lot of LGBT people in what we called our Hill family. And that was like uh, what they would call today an encampment. But um, there was a lot of this and it was just very much like 
you are who you say you are. Like, we accept you. Like, you know, you prove the type of person that you are kind of thing. Um, and um, that had really become like my, my central like community and my family out there. And so they had tried to tell me about certain organizations uh, that I could go to because I was under the age of 25. So there was a lot more places I could go to. Not a lot, but a couple more. Um, and um, I ended up, uh, the outreach workers from this place started coming, doing outreach with me, remembering my name, remembering just very minuscule things about me until eventually like I got myself going into their drop-in location. Um, shortly after that, I found out that I had a son on the way. And um, so that lit a fire under me to start really seeking housing and getting indoors. So, um, so that team of people like uh, my care team, it was made up of like a therapist, case manager, um and uh when my son was born he even had his own like therapist and case manager um everybody like worked together as a team and 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 they knew me and so that was like uh kind of cool because they wouldn't like they knew not to necessarily suggest like one of the things that was important to me um i was pretty much happy to take anything that came my way as far as like housing just grateful to have anything but one of the things that i wouldn't accept was uh, living in housing that was like LGBT hostile. So, um, so they kind of were able to weed out some of those places for me, which was cool because it didn't expose me to any additional trauma. And um, ultimately we went the route of, uh, be, uh, because of like my housing instability and um, uh, I had a, a domestic violence instance committed against me um, and thus DCFS got involved. Um, they tested me. I came up positive for marijuana, um, which was only medicinally legal at the time. And so um, with the help of my case managers, we decided that the next route for me uh, was going to be to go to rehab. And one of the main reasons for this was I would have a residential, so I would be indoors. Um, and I could complete like the judges requirements that I attend anger management and life skills. So um, it took about 10 months to get my son back, but um, rehab was one of the most challenging and learning experiences for me. Um, and there were a lot of lessons that I learned there and I just wanted to share a couple of them with you. So, um, one uh, was the first day I'm there. Um, I'm already feeling very um, The rehab that was available to me was very far away from my community. It was like very far east. Um, it wasn't an LGBT friendly environment. Um, but uh, I was trying to do everything that I could to get my son back in custody of my son back. So um, I hadn't eaten. I was really depressed. Uh, couldn't stop crying. I felt like I failed my son. I felt, um, you know, torn apart that he was going to be spending time in a, uh, like a foster parent's home who didn't know him, you know, and um, and so at one point, I just kind of going into the dorms, I fainted and um, I start hearing them over the intercom and they're going code blue, code blue. And then these two men run up to me and they got their lanyards and all their millions of keys. And um, they're like, what did you take? What did you take? And so at that time for me, like, I felt like the most important thing for them to know was like that I was different. And that I didn't take anything because I just shouted, I'm here for the pot. Um, I wanted them to know that I'm different, right? Throughout like my time and my learning experiences. So uh, one of those men with the lanyards, his name was Anthony and we butted heads like crazy. 
Um, but one of the main lessons he taught me was spot the similarities and not the differences. And so um, I don't necessarily just mean this is an LGBT T hostile environment. This was, um, they just really did not have a, a whole lot of education on any of it. So um, at one point I'm in a support group and I'm feeling, you know, everybody said this is a safe space. This is a processing group and we're just talking about stuff. So I mentioned that I am pansexual, um, which for those of you who don't know, it's some say like bisexual, but uh, recognizing that there are more than two genders. So um, for me, I just don't think that gender plays a role in who I find attractive. So, um, so we're in the support group and I say that, and then one of these girls says, that means you have sex with animals. And I was like, no, no. And there was no facilitator and the whole room had pretty much turned against me at that point. And so I'm trying to like explain, you know, and nobody knows that. So um, I'm frustrated and I go out to the smoking tables and I see Anthony sitting there and he's on his break and I don't care. And I walk right up to him and I'm like, you know, these people are like stupid. I need your help because like, can you go tell them that's not what that means? And so we're sitting there and we're talking. Uh, he did like, you know, clear it up or whatever, but we didn't have phones. It wasn't like anybody, like it was rehab. So you, they, they take your phone. It wasn't like anybody in the room could just like Google and see it, the definition. So, um, it was, uh, I would also hear about, you know, previous, uh, LGBT people who had stayed there at one point there was a they talked about these two women that were like put off in this room um, and they weren't allowed to like use the same facilities as the men or the women and um, it was because they were trans women and um, so a lot of that started happening uh, too you know and uh, but Anthony's thing that he told me that day was like with these people you know, they're not all going to be the same. You have to spot the similarities and not the differences. And that was so hard because I, the difference is the easiest thing for us to spot, right? That's, that's like before first impressions, we will notice a difference between us and someone else. Um, but you can actively like practice and like work that into uh, your growth to spot the similarities and not the differences. So um, uh, that same girl continued to, you know, just baffle me with uh, her ignorance at times. And um, Anthony and I would have to have a lot of smoke breaks together where he would just drop these like super wise uh, things on us. And one of the times he said, um, you can do anything you want in life. And I'm like, no, you can't, that's not true. You know, and he said, no, you can't. You can do anything you want in life as long as you're willing to live with the consequences. And so that was brilliant. Um, I got in a lot of trouble in rehab for doing little petty things. I was very sneaky. We were not allowed to have snacks in our rooms. Um, and I would always try to get away with having snacks in my room. I wanted to uh, kind of have that, uh, you know, reward or whatever but um Anthony would be nowhere around I'd be looking for him and I'd be like okay you know tuck a bag of chips under my shirt try to walk to my room and I'd hear over the loudspeaker Levi report to station four report to station four and then I had I'd have to go over there and I'd have to get extra duty hours like extra chores and deal with my consequences um but he was right you know like that is one of the things that we do we just kind of like gauge our consequences so um there was always a lot of back and forth with him and I regarding uh it's seemingly like he uh staff didn't want me talking to either males or females um who stayed there and there was a lot of double standards when it came to that so um where I will end on this lesson and where I ultimately uh learned this lesson was throughout knowing Anthony, I had found out that 
while he is a speaker for NA and um, just an incredible, like, you know, wisdom giver, um, he had no idea that his son was using and his son OD'd and passed away. Uh, one night I was being sneaky and I went into the TV room and I was watching something on MTV. Um, I believe it was about pride or it was something along those lines. And so I could hear Anthony's keys coming down the hallway and I was like, oh my God, I'm in trouble. And so for the first time he comes in and he sits down and he's like, what are you watching? And I said, you know, it's about pride. And um, he said, so I know you think that you're different, but there's a lot of things that you're going to learn here that are going to make you a better person in life. And he said, would it be helpful if I pushed for you to be able to attend an LGBT meeting offsite once a week? And I started to cry and I said, yes, thank you. And so it was that night that Anthony told me that where he had lost his son. Um, he had one daughter left who was a lesbian and he had a whole lot of misconceptions about the gay community. So uh, he was terrified that he was gonna lose not only his son, but his daughter also. And so that was the night that I fully learned the lesson of spot the similarities and not the differences. And I hope that you guys can take that with you and uh, spot your own similarities in that story. So thank you. Thank you so much, Levi, for uh, sharing your story. Guys, can we please just show a round of uh, emojis just to show <laughs> our appreciation for Levi? Thank you so much for sharing, Levi. And with that being said, guys, I want to open the floor to anybody here that would like to ask a question to Levi, um, you can speak up, raise your hand, type it in the chat, whatever you prefer. Please ask away. Please don't be shy. Seeing lots of thank yous in the chat. You're welcome, guys, of course. Um, I, have a, I have a question. Uh, Levi, thank you so much for sharing that story. It was, it was very like a lot of emotions, touching, inspiring, informative. Um, my question is uh, just like about the healing process. Like that's a lot that you went through. And so what was that healing process like for you to go from like, that really hostile and unsafe situation to like where you are today as like a caseworker, you're trying to like build housing, you're working with people who are homeless, getting them off the streets yourself. Like, so what was that healing journey like for you? Cause it seems, sounds like there's like more than just growth. There was like, there's a lot. Yeah, um, the, the healing part is uh, undoubtedly one of the areas of, um, I guess kind of advocacy or the storytelling part that doesn't get told. And it's so important because um, while they're, you know, housing does end homelessness. There's often so much mental health that goes with that. And I already had a, a bit of PTSD for my childhood, but um, uh, much more uh, from the police after experiencing homelessness. Um, so there were uh, like pitfalls that like uh, I, I did have to kind of get through on my own. And, and the other thing too, that um, aside from just being LGBT was in that rehab, it was not, I was the only person there that had been homeless. Um, it was people who were there for substance use. Um, and, uh, but um, they hadn't been homeless. And um, as you, I didn't mention this either, but I don't know if you can imagine like being the only person in a rehab for pot, but I got picked on quite a bit. Um, so, um, it was, it was a lot of, uh, I feel like that lesson so much carried me with everyone, um, in, in that recovery process. And so, um, I learned to re to rely on therapists more, 
Um, at one point though, it did feel like, you know, there was like a sort of a drop off in services where uh, I had been housed for a certain period of time, <clears throat> excuse me. And then, um, then those uh, homeless service, like homeless specific services were kind of no longer available to me. And then I shifted into this world of um, like sort of clinical mental health uh, therapy that, you know, no one had been homeless. Um, and um, so um, it's been a whole journey, but I think that like, I have recognized that where I spot like my shortcomings, I have that choice to like make that growth, if that makes sense, so. Thank you for answering that question. Indeed. I have a, I have a question, Levi. Yep. Um, something that I've been thinking about recently and made me think when you were talking about LGBTQ plus hostility, um, one of our chapters recently started recruiting people and other chapters, the UCs, will soon start to recruit new members. Um, something which I have heard from some of the people that were recruiting was that some members were turned down because they showed some uh, prejudice. For instance, when asked about what your preferred pronouns were, they would say, I, I don't really, you know, they would show kind of like, uh, I, I guess he is sort of showing a little bit of intolerance towards um, towards that. And, and I know that in your case, you obviously have to um, turn away from LGBTQ facility. But I wanted to know your perspective on us as an organization who are hoping to educate students is when students show some tendencies to not be so tolerable or sensitive, uh, what should we do? Should we accept students attempt to uh, maybe push them in a better direction or should we maybe turn them down because it could be dangerous to the people that we are trying to help? Um, I don't know necessarily um but I definitely like know what you mean when it comes to like kind of asking people very basic questions and they very evidently sort of state their prejudice um so the other thing is that I'm a housing navigator now downtown now and I do surveys like all day so that I get people on the housing wait list and um when it gets to the question about sexual orientation um I'll, I'll have you know some people just be like straight what or I'll ask them you know their gender and they're like I'm a man what do I look like I'm not you know um what's her face uh <clears throat> but um like and it, it and so like it is always really interesting to like because people will kind of like show themselves and show their character in that um I don't know uh I don't know necessarily one way or the other but um but it would definitely demonstrate that they they could use some growth. So, <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. It's just something that I it's on my mind because you know I was just wondering as a leader how much can we do, and you know we are in a time where we are still being socialized. You know what I mean. So, uh, I I think there's kind of some hope. But anyways, yeah. thank you for your perspective on that. Indeed, and I think it like really only becomes like I mean that. Uh, that is uh, like kind of an like an unenlightened perspective, right? If they if they show themselves in that way, but it's also not as like uh, where there's like damaging experiences where someone says where they're calling a trans woman a he, um, and you know saying well, but because my beliefs like that, that to me is like what I would classify as intolerable, you know, um, but yeah everybody's like growing and learning together and and we don't have to understand um we don't you know uh that that girl in rehab that was constantly like putting metaphorical like tripping hazards in my way um you know I sat there and tried to spot the similarities and we had some and she had uh a kid that she was there trying to get custody back of you know and so 
Um, some people are just, you know, it's, it, we, it's, we don't have to like take it personal or take it upon us, but, um, yeah, we can just try to like spot the similarities and, and notice our shared experiences. So. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else speak up? Sure, I have a question. Um, I was curious how you, uh, maybe you kind of touched it, but maybe a little more in depth of like kind of how you, how you transitioned and got into the the work that you do now and how, um, cause to me, I mean, it sounds very, very interesting. I just love to hear more. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, so uh i went through like a whole wheel of uh just like the very first housing option may not always be the most appropriate fitting one i went through a lot of terrible terrible jobs before uh ending back up with like my family uh so to speak in homeless services um but uh the very first one i got was a uh debt collector and so i was that guy that was calling people and talking about a debt from eight years ago and at one point um you know like I mentioned I have PTSD from the police and there were just two police officers talking to me at a gas station one day and they said and I at first I was feeling all proud of myself because I'm like I'm not homeless anymore like you can't do anything to me um but then they said what do you do for work and I was like oh no and (laughs) <laughs> and I didn't want to tell them. And they were like, what is it? Like, you know, are you a drug dealer? Are you this? Are you that? And I'm like, no, uh, I can't tell you. Like, I'm, I work for the bad guys. And they were like, no, you don't. Like, well, just tell us. And so I had to tell them that I was a debt collector. And they were just like, get out of here. You know, they were so like, so that is one position that I feel like unanimously <laughs> um, everyone hates. And um, it was terrible getting up and going to work there every day after that I did a bunch of door-to-door stuff um I can walk really fast so I put out a lot of flyers and then um one of the really like kind of healing parts of like my career healing journey I guess was um I started sign spinning at one point and I really loved that so like one of the things because I was homeless I used to eat like you know food from like trash cans food people were throwing away like I could, I didn't feel like I could work in like a restaurant where people would be like, oh, these fries are cold. And like, I would just be like, what? Like <laughs> my friends are dying, you know? Like, and so, um, so with sign spinning, it was me and the music and it wasn't customer service. It wasn't like one-on-one people interaction because I just still like had very bad social uh, anxieties. And so it was me, the music, and I would just like have fun with a, um, you know, one of those four by two foot signs spinning it and having a blast. And then like throughout that time, there was people in the community who kind of like liked, you know, seeing me dance out there as like a staple in the area. And um, and then I started my own sign spinning business for a while. Um, and, uh, and then I pretty much kind of dropped that cold turkey to start working in uh, social services as peer support. And um, 100% have been uh like this is this is the right fit for me this is my gift and if people people say like you know you go through things for a reason and and if this was it then like I feel like it it was you know um but um so I worked with transitional age youth at first in a residential um transitional living program um which was so rewarding and I had a connection with the youth in a way that um other staff members didn't necessarily either because they were too clinical or just because, um, you know, maybe the age difference, but also just because I had literally lived through it, you know, and, um, and then I worked with, um, the refugees, uh, when they came to the San Diego convention center, um, that was a beautiful and enlightening experience for me. Um, they, uh, refugees are often, also a statistic that will end up homeless. Um, and um, bottom line, they were kids uh, 
so I was really like really happy to work in that environment as well and then um I switched to working with NAMI which uh we have a clubhouse downtown I don't know if any of you are familiar with the clubhouse model but it's like a drop-in center but um they're able to uh attend groups they can shower uh, meet with case managers housing navigators we can get them on the housing wait list and all that and then I started working with lived experience advisors which is um a group who advocates we are all people with lived experience who um you know have overcome those obstacles so we try to demonstrate um to like our city leaders um and others um what ended our homelessness and the um the ironic thing that all of us have in common is that uh homes ended our homelessness um and so there's a lot of, oh, we're looking for solutions out there, you know, and you always hear this like, oh, these people met and they talked about this and like, we're meeting with them to talk about this. But at the end of the day, it just was the homes, that, that was it. So, um, but yeah, um, I'm just, I'm really incredibly grateful to be in the work that I'm in today too, because I do see how much I'm needed and, and it's tough, but I don't, I don't, you know, I can't imagine doing anything else. And I can't imagine like them, you know, talking to anybody else the way that they talk to me. Because even um, in San Diego, um, there are other organizations and, and stuff that the LGBT acceptance isn't there. And like, um, so I'll have, you know, people like come find me and, um, and we have our community. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Does anybody else have another question? This will be the last call for any more questions. All right, uh, I guess people don't have any more questions. Levi, um, I wanna thank you so much for your time. I was wondering, do you have any uh, socials or email anything you want to where people could maybe reach you if they have any questions after yeah definitely so on social um on twitter and instagram it's the solution 619 on tiktok it is homeful solution um uh if if any of you guys are doing outreach specifically in the direction of um uh like transit youth uh tiktok is actually like an incredible tool to use for outreach because they're on there um so yeah just a little tidbit but um so yeah tiktok uh twitter um instagram and then you can also email me at homefulsolution at gmail.com awesome thank you so much thank levi awesome thank you everybody so much All right, guys, uh, once again, thank you so much, Levi. And now we will be going into a quick, uh, quick break. Yeah, of what he's, um, of what he's been working on. Um, so, um, so right now, so chapter extension is basically, um, we're working on expanding our, our organization at different universities. Um, so he's helping launch currently uh, CSU Fullerton, UCI, and uh, CSU Northridge. So he's reaching out to local academic institutions to find candidates for starting a new chapter. Uh, Sun has also been on onboarding and mentoring new, new boards as they navigate setting up as a local chapter and preparing them for outreach. Um, and he's also setting up goals and a roadmap to get there. So he, and another project that he's also working on is um, putting our VSN program um, and implementing it as a class credit in universities. So he's collaborating with colleges to reach out to the larger student body and grant them credit for services. So um, this is going to be a really cool opportunity for students to be able to participate in our VSN program, but also get credit, our class credit for it. So 
So this, we're hoping that um, like increases um, our number of volunteer service navigators and um, just involvement in that. Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, so, and I'm, uh, let's see, and we have five current chapters right now. So we have University of Oregon, UCSB, UCR, UC San Diego, and SDSU. So I know um, there are a lot of people here um, from different chapters here. So thank you for being here. Um, so I'm just gonna explain the different applications that we use within chapter operations. Um, so the main, uh, one of our uh, main websites we use is Google Classroom and Google Drive. So these are gonna be helpful for chapters um, and it's a centralized place to find important documents and trainings. Every chapter has access to our Google Classroom and Google Drive. Um, so as far as important documents um, and trainings, such as like training for VOMO, which I'll go into more about that, um, expectations of chapters. Um, and then you can also find our um, homeless outreach protocol, um, which is our ARS training, which I have listed on the right side there. Um, so that training is required for all members to conduct outreach. And then we follow the ARS uh, protocol, which is assess the situation, introducing yourself, belief, less resource, streamline prospective clients, and saying thank you. Um, I know SDCU just had their training, um, and more chapters are going to, once they start school, as they first started school, um, will continue that as well and have their training for new members. And I also want to go into um, chapter goals and expectations. Um, so in order to be successful and just have retention um, and getting new members, we want a successful recruitment cycle, which includes like aiming to recruit about 15 uh, people or more per cycle, recruitment cycle. Um, and that's just a, a goal. Um, we do definitely want quality over quantity of volunteers. Um, so definitely want people who are very passionate um, and really want to be involved in MSP to join. And then also if there's a volunteer service navigation program at your chapter, um, we want successful recruitment in that and getting two or three new VSNs. And for fundraisers, um, our goals are to raise a thousand per quarter or 1500 per semester. And then for new chapters, it would be a thousand per year. And then also for service outreach shifts, the expectation is to train all new members in the ARS protocol, which I just discussed, and have everyone registered on VOMO and um, and everyone signed up with our waiver and all that for to begin outreach. Um, and then also a goal is to have at least one regular scheduled outreach with a local partnership um, and also host street outreach if possible. Um, and that frequency can be determined by chapters as well. Uh, we do recommend um, doing other events such as having workshops, um, like two to three per year. Uh, we do have a YouTube channel that has uh, examples of workshops that you can model after or you can create your own. Um, that's just a great way to um, provide a great opportunity to like, learn more about homelessness and awareness, to spread awareness. Um, we've had community forums in the past, um, which those could be your workshops, and we're hoping to launch that next semester. Um, and um, also, another thing you have with your, your chapters is also having socials, um, two to three per year. Great, that's a, um, another great way to engage um, your, your chapter and the community, um, just bonding with each other. Um, and also having donation drives is another um, way to involve the community. So those are some of the expectations for each chapter. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go into um, some information about VOMO. Um, I've known, I've like, we talked about VOMO a lot um, and now it sounds like Venmo, but it's definitely different. Um, do you guys, anyone know what it stands for, VOMO? I know I've just, I think I talked about this with a few people, but anyone have a guess of what VOMO stands for? No one? No one brave enough? <laughs> well, I guess you all learned something new today. VOMO stands for, 
Sweet Face is very old like rocket. <laughs> Unfortunately not. Um, it stands for volunteer movement. So, um, which makes sense because that's basically what the whole FOMO is. Um, so it's a volunteer management software um, that we're using. Um, <laughs> and um, basically it's, it, it uh, manages volunteers, recruits volunteers and increases engagement. Um, so each chapter has their own FOMO page. Um, and you're, we have like five campaigns, one campaign for each chapter and you can add projects to it. Um, so your projects would be your outreach opportunities. And how it works is for your group attends outreach, each member signs up on FOMO, they create their own account and profile, um, and then you sign up for whichever outreach you're going on um, for that day. And it gives all sorts of cool data um, afterwards, like it shows the total amount of volunteer hours, the different types of outreach um, and also the economic impact, which is really cool. Um, this is also a great way for students to show they've done volunteer hours. Like if a class requires community service, you can like log into your profile and it says like, this is what I've done. Um, and then also VOMO has this awesome opportunity where they have rewards too. Um, so like once you accumulate like 20 hours of volunteer hours, you could be rewarded a $5 gift card or you can choose to give that $5 back to MSP or to another organization. So very cool. Um, and then if you get more, if you get 40 hours, you'll get $10. So it's, it's really, um, uh, it's a really neat opportunity uh, just to engage volunteers. Um, but I will say VOMO is still rebuilding the reward system. So it's not in effect yet, but once it will get running again, I'll let the chapters know uh, once that's started. And then last thing I'm gonna talk about is Classy. So I'm sure you all have heard of Classy. This is gonna be our website, or has been our website for donations and a centralized place where people can donate. Um, so for example, our, our upcoming fundraiser, the Pumpkin Palooza, you all purchase your tickets via Classy. So, um, and I know the next slides are gonna go into more about fundraising. So that is all for me. <laughs> Just wanted to throw a quick update. We actually decided to go for tickets through Ticket Tailor instead of Classy just because there was like a QR code thing going on. But ultimately, Classy is for everything else. Everything else. It's just a weird little little uh, fringe case there. But um, yeah, so I'm filling in for a few people with uh, fundraising and finance today just because they weren't able to make it out. But thank you, Anunag or Egg, uh, for... Uh, all the chapter operation stuff. I'm just gonna cover more in terms of chapter fundraising. So there's a bunch of different types. These are kind of similar slides to last year's collaborative. There's a single tier, multi-tier types of uh, fundraising. So maybe in the single tier, it's like the chapter has one big whole thing. Everyone reaches out and brings people to, to, to the event and go from there. Multi-tier is more like you set up a campaign page. It's kind of like a peer-to-peer. -peer. I don't know if anyone has like a Camp Kesem chapter on your campus, but they kind of do a very peer-to-peer -peer type uh, fundraising. And we've done this in the past too uh, with our cohorts, cohort fundraising, and it's proven to be very successful. So just wanted to like throw this out there as kind of inspiration for what you might want to use in this coming year. So on the next slide, um, uh, you know, what, why peer-to-peer, -peer, what is it? Each active fundraiser on average, these are just some stats, brings in about $568 on average. Um, and then that way you can, you can leverage your individual supporters, draw on their networks, access a broader donor pool. And with that, you know, make it just, it's a lot of just utilizing your connections and finding through community and going that way. So it's a great way to get, you know, younger siblings and relatives. Uh, to become core fundraisers and things like that. And you don't have to do as big events of like selling boba, succulents, or spam to like, You know, doing both is always great. Um, and then so on the next slide, uh, yeah, with the fundraising platform, uh, Erica kind of went across a lot of what Classy does. This is just like a rehash of like the different little details and uh, uh, things that you can use the Classy platform with. And so the hope and goal is for you guys 
to be able to utilize this tool in helping you with your fundraisers, helping you manage like getting the money through online means or in-person means and along with that. And they have a lot of uh, training videos online as well. If you want to learn how to do specific things and uh, how to set certain things up here or there, and you guys should have access to to using a lot of that and setting things up in those in, the, in that way, so it can make things a little bit easier for you guys as opposed to you know a bunch of Google Sheets or something like that. Um, so yeah, so stay classy, right? Um, and then on the next slide, so just some fundraising examples from the past. Uh, we've had our seeds of change. Uh, fundraiser, we've done the community forum series by doing that with the tickets, we were actually able to raise money in addition to doing that just as a side thing. It wasn't even us trying to do a fundraiser. We just added the option for people to donate and some people did. So that was cool. Um, and finally, you know, we did a fundraising kickoff last year uh, to kind of start using the Classy platform and, and it, it did pretty well. We raised about like $2,000 just like with a few people just to, like test and see how things worked out with it. Um, but yeah, I there's one that I do want to highlight if you click on the next slide. Uh, or sorry, where to start? The highlight will come after this one. Got the slides a little mixed up. Um, but these are some examples, you know, for any occasion, you can like have your own birthday fundraiser, holiday, whatever. You can even ask your own family, friends or whatever, if they want to try and help out with MSP and they don't know what to do, they can't like donate their time and like join, you can be like, hey, maybe set up your own campaign. You can use this classy thing and set it up yourself without having to really do anything, do any too much. And it's pretty pretty easy, pretty simple that way. Um, so these are just a bunch of options that people can do anything like that. I know I did like a whip flip thing one year, uh, last year it was, it was dumb, but it raised money. Um, and then on the next slide is a DIY feature of someone special. Uh, and she was able to raise like a lot of money. I keep blanking on the number. How was it like multiple, like triple digits? What was it? Um, it was over $1,200. <laughs> over $1,200 just by herself and running. So not only did she work out, but she also like helped out. So I think that was like pretty cool. It was awesome. It's just like one example of a way to kind of use classy and like the, that peer-to-peer -peer type of fundraising model to just raise money as an individual in addition to your chapter stuff. So yeah. Um, and then with that, I just want to highlight, you know, upcoming fundraiser, uh, Pumpkin Palooza. Uh, it's October 8th at San Diego base. So if you are in San Diego, but you want to come out, you can come to San Diego. That's an excuse to visit. Um, but outside of that, it, it's going to be like a family friendly event. It's in Vista, so North County. Uh, and it's, there's going to be live music, vendors, crafts, photo booth, pumpkins, tons of pumpkins, uh, food trucks, games, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so it's going to be an exciting thing. It's our first like fundraising event at the leadership level, so not at a chapter level. So it, 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 we're hoping we can kind of reach out to spaces outside of just like the university communities and kind of grow in that regard and uh, build, build more connections throughout the rest of San Diego as well. Um, and so it's exciting. Come out if you can make it. If not, please share with your friends, family, and everyone. If, uh, and if they can't make it, you can tell them, you know, maybe just donate instead or something like that. And so excited for that. And we'll, we'll see how things go. We're planning to have a few more in-person fundraising events throughout the rest of this term. So I have one planned sort of for the holidays sometime in December and then two more come the next year. Um, so keep your eyes peeled. And now for chapter finance, uh, this is something, so our director of finance is Kwok. He was unable to make it, he had a work conflict. And so he kind of set up a little bit of a system in terms of how we do reimbursements and things like that. A lot of what we want is we understand, you know, being uh, in university and things like that, sometimes you need to purchase items for either like a fundraising event or care package event, something like that. And, and we don't want you guys to be limited because you can't, you don't want to like, pay out of your own pocket. You're already donating your time. You're already donating a lot of energy you yourself. So it's like, we want to help you kind of subsidize a lot of that cost and 
uh, kind of invest in you guys as a chapter to, to do what you need to and you get through there. And so with that, there's a $500 uh, per quarter system, like per quarter or $750 per semester system allowance, just because, you know, timelines are a little different, but the math maths out to make it pretty even there. Um, and so a lot of the pieces of this is you're going to create a budget at the beginning of the term, and then you're going to meet with Paul, the director of finance. Uh, is there more to this? Slide? Okay. And then pretty much there's going to be a Google form. You're going to track the transactions as they occur. Uh, yeah, just click through the whole slide until it finishes up. There we go. Perfect. Um, so it's just like a quick um, workbook just to like keep track of the, the details for our accounting purposes when we have to file taxes and things like that. Um, the reimbursements are only for spending. Uh, uh, okay, sorry. So that's like the top part of the budgeting part uh, with the allowance that gets just sent to you from the get-go. You only get that money once you met with Quark. So that kind of incentivizes you guys to meet. And if you don't, um, like in terms of like how money works and like if somehow some part of the money seems kind of not to add up or is missing, then that will be subtracted from your allowance from the next quarter or semester. So just try to keep things uh, on track and make, you know, make it make sense in, in a way with the workforce. And then we have another uh, part at the bottom, which is for reimbursement. So say you budget and then all of a sudden something happens, you realize you're gonna have to go over budget or something. This way, if you like spend something, this is for like spending something not included in the budget and uh, you know, maybe some emergency happens like that, then you can uh, uh, submit this at the end of the term and like get reimbursed with that. So that, um, you know, we get it, things happen. Sometimes things can be a little stressful. So this allows uh, ways for us to kind of navigate different, different, different areas that might happen ways. And then payments, please click through the, perfect. Yeah, so we have a few different options in terms of payments. We have like a Venmo, we have Classy, and then we have Zelle. So these are like QR codes to access that or use in terms of what you need for fundraising and things along those lines. Um, but yeah, you can talk to Falk in terms of like some of the finance stuff. There's also Cash App, and, uh, I believe just like regular credit card. Um, so, so yeah. He put more slides than I thought he would, not gonna lie. But anyways, so yeah, this is just a more detail of the same forms that I talked about with the chapter finance workbook and the, the car or the reimbursement one. We'll move on to the next slide. And he added QR codes for them too. All right, just handing it off to, um, I believe, Esther for yeah. Service Navigation. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Esther. I'm one of the co-directors of Serv Service Navigation along with Christine. So we're just gonna talk a bit about our program and what we do. Oh, oh okay, perfect. Okay, so service navigation is a free opt-in or opt-in program for anyone that's experiencing homelessness or is at risk of it. So we have a bunch of VSNs that are from each of the different chapters. And basically we try to set them up with a person that has applied for our program, um, usually someone that's pretty close to them, but if not, um, everything's done virtually. So you can still interact with people that are on the other side of the state. Um, so basically, we just want to provide any supplementary support to assist clients as they pursue um, trying to get housing. And it's very low barrier to the client. All they have to do is fill out, um, two op um, fill out an application, um, which you'll see later. Um, usually, VSNs only have about three um, three clients that they work with. Work with. Um, rarely do we ever get up to five, um, but that is the max caseload. So it's very person-centered, like we wanna to talk to the clients and see what they need help with. Um, there's no like structured um, thing of like what we help them out with, it's whatever they need help with. And there's a very low rate of burnout among VSNs. So now we're gonna talk about what is service navigation. So to be a part of it, um, we really only want you to be in there for at least one quarter or semester, depending on what school you go to. 
Um, we really look for a clear passion of service, um, someone that's really good at talking with others, communication, um, someone that's willing to understand what others are going through and cultural competency. Also accountability. Um, a lot of what you do is on your own. We give you like everything that you need to do well, but it is up to you to contact your clients and speak with them. So there needs to be accountability there. We do ask for some knowledge about homelessness. Of course, we'll teach you everything else as well. But just knowing that homelessness is something that can happen to anybody, um, the different types of things that can lead to it, um, that just adds and makes you a better BSN. And we really do want consistent commitment. Um, we would ask for at least one year of you um, joining MSP and being a BSN, just one year, um, including summer. And so this is how the VSN program is structured. So we have two co-directors co of service navigation, me and Christine, and then we have um, case coordinators at all of the chapters. So UVO, UCSD, um, UCR, and SCSU. And then under the case coordinators, we have VSNs. So, to help out your clients, these are the things that we typically help them with. So resume building, um, connecting them to community services that are around them, helping them with applications such as like CalFresh, um, weekly check-ins. We really ask that you just check in with your client at least once a week. That could be through text or through phone call, whichever one works best for them. And we also help them out um, with our community relief fund. You guys have probably heard it out heard about it before that's what we fundraise for so basically if a client needs help with like rental assistance or they're trying to apply for like a GED program and they need some help with that we can look to our community relief fund and we can help them out um, paying for the program that they need help with or assisting them a bit with their rental assistance And then, yeah, this is what I was just talking about. So our community relief fund, we really do help with like grant, um, healthcare if they need like medicine, basic needs like clothing or things that they won't be able to get from like another um, community service, um, personal enrichment, like the GED program I was talking about. Also transportation. A lot of what we do is helping people out, getting like bus passes. So we can fill out um, their bus passes so that they're able to transport to their jobs, to their school, um, whatever they need help with. And I'm gonna pass it over to Christine now. Hi everyone, I'm Christine. I'm the other uh, co-director of service navigation. Um, so now I'm just going to talk about like where the clients come from. So um, I mean, there's like three sources of like where we get our clients from. So uh, the first one is from the street outreach. So when you guys go to um, outreach um, and talk to people and fill out that survey for if they want um, extra help with MSP. Um, they come back to us and we assign those clients to a VSN if they're within our scope of practice. So like if if we can actually help them in some way, we'll assign them to a VSN. Or we have our hotline. So again, like when we go on outreach, um, we give out our hotline number or anyone could like just find our hotline number and call and then it would go to Ivy who manages the hotline and then again we'll like approve the client and then um, hand that over to VSN um, and then the third one is referrals from other organizations we've worked with like many organizations in the past and some of them kind of um, know us already and um, we have like a relationship with them so they know that they know what MSP can do, and so they will refer their clients to us for extra help and support. And basically, like those clients um, will fill out an application or referral form with the help of their like um, case manager or um, uh, the hotline or the outreach. And then um, those clients will come to me and Esther, and then we will assign them to a VSN. And that's basically the workflow of where the clients come from. And so, okay, so to become an, uh, a VSN, 
Um, you have to commit to one year and we do this because um, we want them, we want you guys to have this like relationship with clients. It's usually like something we help them with kind of long term over like a few months or more. Um, so we want to commit to one year and that includes summer. Um, and you have to have at least one semester of experience in MSP because we want you guys to um, like know or have that have that like base of knowledge um, and education first. And then so for this cycle, I guess, um, we are holding applications. Um, they will be closing on November 6th. Um, and interviews will happen November 12th and 13th. And then um, trainings will be sometime in January. It's a two day training. Um, and there's the link to apply. Um, I think we'll probably have it posted somewhere later, but, um, and we'll probably send it out to the chapters and everything so you guys can do the recruitment, but that's, that's what we're requiring for VSNs at the moment. And we also have, um, an internship program in the works. So we're working with like the uh, different parts of like different universities to kind of establish some kind of um, credit for being a VSN so that people outside of MSP or in MSP can kind of um, have some more in incentive to become a VSN if they get like course credit for it. Um, so yeah, we'll allow VSNs to receive school credit for their work with MSP. And we want this program to last for one school term. Um, and applicants must attend homeless outreach uh, two times, either with MSP or another nonprofit, or be a member of MSP already for at least one term. So that's because if they're not an MSP member, they might not have that education or that knowledge, that experience with the homeless community. So we just want whoever is applying to this program to get that education um, so they're at the same level as a MSP member BSN. Um, oh yeah, and Erica mentioned some have already gotten course credit in the past too. So if um, anyone's interested, um, yeah, to get course credit, it's something that's like we've like done it before as possible. Um, if you can talk to like an advisor or something, but we're, we're trying to get it like standardized, like a program um, that's like known by the career centers and universities and all that stuff. So that's, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and now just some like comments from like, uh, oh wait, I was going to the testimonies. Okay, the, some testimonies from our like previous clients. So one person has said that what was unique about working with MSP was that I felt his energy that he really cared so we really want like BSNs to be passionate and be really good at working with um, people and have those good interpersonal skills. So show you really care. And another person said, he helped me, um, you helped me with transportation and helped me with getting my job and filling out my resume. So those are just the kind of services that we provide for our clients and like a little goes a long way in helping um, a client. Uh, yeah, that's all I have. Alrighty, sorry for uh, switching a little bit too early there, Christine. Uh, but thank you so much. Thank you, Esther, Lin Lin, and Egg. Um, that being said, now guys, we are going to take a five minute break. Uh, once we regroup, we'll go into a little discussion activity, and then we'll finish up with some closing words from somebody very special. So we'll regroup in uh, five minutes. And let me just let me just resume recording real quick. Um, and I chose SCSU. It was close to home, but I wasn't sure what to do. I came undecided. I didn't have a major. Um, you know, I was there questioning what I wanted to do. Um, so like any confused freshman does, um, I joined a fraternity. Uh, I was part of fraternity for a little bit. Um, but I quickly realized that that was not the life for me. 
Um, it was fun for the first couple of months. Then I started to lose interest. I, I didn't see much value. Well, I quit after about a year and a half of being part of that fraternity. And then COVID hit and sent everybody home. And there I was, again, confused, not sure what to do, feeling alienated. Um, and I found MSP. It was very random. One day, I just found it through Instagram, through Rose. Uh, some of you may know Rose, uh, former president of SDSU. I randomly followed her, and she started posting stuff about MSP. And I was like, oh, this looks kind of cool. She's trying to make new friends. And I joined MSP. And within a couple of uh, a couple of months, I did this. I used my uh, my my <laughs> uh, essentially I used my body for money. That's another way of putting it. But uh, uh, it worked. <laughs> it raised a couple hundred bucks very quickly. And then I sort of realized that you know what? Uh, I think MSP might be something pretty big in my life. And from then on, I became more involved. I met a lot of cool people, a lot of people that I think are going to be friends for for the rest of my life. Um, I became VSN. I went through ups and downs with clients, but learned a lot of things about how to communicate with people, how to be, uh, how to show sympathy, how to be empathetic, how to have patience. Um, and uh, I remember one one time, I forget if it was a text or a call, I think Martin, Martin called me um, and he started talking to me about this position of a secretary slash director of operations and thinking that I would be a good fit for the job and so on. And I was like, you know what? I think I want to do it. Um, and so I did it. And now I am the director of operations for MSP. I joined MSP out of randomness. I learned about the cause. I stayed for the people. I stayed for the experiences that I've shared out there doing outreach and I will continue to do so. So now that I told my little story, we're going to go into some discussion rooms and you will have one or two leaders in those discussion rooms that uh, will ask you a couple questions, will lead conversation. But honestly, I just want you guys to maybe tell each other stories, talk about why you joined MSP, why you stayed, and how has MSP uh, changed your perspective um, and what you want to see out of MSP going forward. Reflecting on, and I was just reflecting on some things that I wish I knew when I was your age. Not that like I'm super older, like I'm a boomer, but there's just growth you get when you're when you're 25 versus when you're 20. So for the first thing is I heard a lot. Alan was talking, or Felipe was talking a little bit about confusion. So I don't know if anyone in this group feels also confused. I'm actually a Gen Z. I'm the I'm the leader of the Gen Z 97. The cutoff. So I don't know if anyone feels like you don't know what you want to do in your life or you're like stressed about your career. I don't know if you're about to go to grad school. Uh, the only advice I would have in your undergrad is don't stress too much about that. Um, I think the most important thing is for you to know who you are. The last thing you want to do is go into a career and not know who you are. Um, I've seen people my age who go into really good careers and they're like stressed out because they are like trying to understand who they are. You know, and I think 20s in general, like maybe even your early 30s, I feel like it's really just about figuring out who you are and what makes you happy. Okay. So that's the first one. The second thing is just you are valuable. Um, just know that, like all of you come into the space. The favorite, my favorite thing about Mustard Seed Project is seeing people who've never taken a leadership position before and then suddenly become leaders. That's happened a lot. Okay. So if you're someone that's never taken up leadership and you're about to be the president or the vice president, like that is actually very beautiful. Take up that leadership position. And the best way for you to be a good leader is to actually just be your best self. Like you want to hone into your strengths, so identifying what is my strength and then just mastering that. Um, so I'm going to go through three more and then I'll show you some photos. It's going to be a bit of a slideshow. But the next thing is doing this is very hard work. It is like some of you, some of y'all, especially from the new chapters, probably feel like there's been some bumpy roads. Uh, I've done this for six years. It has been hard work. I've had events where nobody showed up. 
whereas like just me and the team I've had um you know outreaches where it was like me begging my classmates to come with me that happens uh it's hard work but it's really worth it like I think I am who I am because of putting in that work um I did homeless outreach almost every single week um when I was in college and when we were talking about sharing our own experiences, I think that there are just so many stories that I can share. And I think that's something that I hold with me forever. And uh, I think that's unique to like, just my experiences as a person, like navigating the world. Uh, the next thing is to know that we are a community. Um, I like to, I've been here for six years and some of you, y'all have been here for actually almost the same, um, but it's really nice to see just where you all go in your life. So if you ever, want to reach out just to talk um you know I'm a first year medical student if you want to learn about like healthcare and medicine um, I also had a career in homeless services so um, if you want to talk about those things Erica is a bioinformaticist she works at Illumina we have lawyers we have different people so this is a network of people so do reach out if you want to talk or just want to want to learn a little bit more and the last thing um, before I show a little bit of slides is to please take pictures. I'm like really huge on pictures. So please do take a lot of pictures. Um, you know, like for example, I'm gonna show this picture in the slides, but I just realized I have this here. So this is the picture of the first board at UCR. Hold on, let me change my. So this is the picture of the first board at UCR. Um, and I'm friends with everyone here still. And I don't know if you think I look the same age, but that's me literally from six years ago. And so it's nice to have pictures because you can remember the good times. All right, so go into my slides. So just a little bit of my shared experience. So this was the first ever homeless outreach. These are a lot of my friends from UC Riverside. Um, again, people that I'm still very close to, and we did homeless outreach in San Diego. Uh, what we did is we assembled care packages and we talked to people who are out on the streets. Um, you know, and I was talking about this a little bit in my small group, but I think when you do homeless outreach and if you're a college student, you likely have a lot of layers of privilege. And so for all of us, it was very eye-opening. It was very eye-opening. It was very just like feeling like we really want to do something more about this. And so then we did. Um, so we started a group at UC Riverside first called the Mustard Seed Project. Um, none of us knew a lot about homelessness. I think I know a lot more than I did six years ago because I got so involved. Um, but I think we started just with our pure intention of wanting to make a difference. And then we've grown a lot since then. And one of my favorite parts about Mustard Seed Project is just seeing everyone build a community at their respective chapters, see leaders grow, see people be impacted by this organization. Um, you know, there have been people who've said that this was their main thing in college. This is the service opportunity they got um, and that it would it helped them navigate what they wanted to do in their lives and gave them perspective on, on you know, their own existence. Um, and since then, we've really grown. And, you know, I, I think like when we all become leaders and we become passionate about this and we try to recruit others for this, it's such a noble cause. It's a really good thing to do. Um, and so this is what you're all about to do in the fall. So it's it's a I think it's a very noble and it's, it's a very great experience. Okay. And then since then, as you all know, we've built different chapters and we're still trying to grow. Here's some fun photos. This is uh, UC Riverside. This is SDSU and this is UCSD. And I was there for all of their homeless outreach trainings. And then I, I think I showed you this already. Okay. And then also just, you know, on top of that, I think the big thing that you should focus on um, as you're doing Mustard Seed Project is helping people who are right in front of you. Uh, so this is um, one of the people we worked with, Tommy. Um, he actually was homeless himself, but he helped run one of our, our partner groups. So we used to help out God, um, God's Extended Hand and uh, he was so endeared by our volunteers um, that actually a few of them raised money to get in that car that's behind him. And so they pulled in thousands of dollars and they helped him get that car. And then uh, during the next time we went, he asked uh, if we can take a photo. And I don't know if you can see how excited he is. <laughs> and then just other people that we've worked with. And then I also just wanted to share 
someone I worked with personally. So I worked with this person through Mustard Seed Project, um, maybe I think for about two years. And she recently sent me this text message. She's going night night referring to her dog. I've never been my I've never seen my doggy lay on your back before. She's so comfy. Thank you, Martin. You may not be a social worker, but you did more for us than any social worker ever has. We'll never forget you. Plus, you're probably the only one that is setting a positive example by going to Chicago City to become a doctor. It actually gives me incentive. I wish nothing but the best for you and your family. And if you ever come to San Diego again and need a place to stay, I have plenty of room. So for this individual, the only thing that was standing in her way of getting into her apartment was actually the security deposit. And so Mustard Seed Project was able to use our CRF to help her get through the door. And so she has a very beautiful place. She has a long story that I don't have to get too in depth in. Um, but the big point is that, you know, I think in Mustard Seed Project, if you can just help one person, you can build a relationship with one person. Um, that's really the point, you know, and I, this is someone that we still communicate with, I still communicate with. Um, and during the last few weeks, um, you know, as I was even moving into my own apartment, um, like my bed didn't come for a few days. And so I was sleeping on the floor and, you know, not to make comparison, but like I was thinking about a lot of the clients that we might have that don't have beds that do sleep on their floors. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that's a little bit what Levi was, Levi was saying, with spotting the similarities. And just the last slide I wanted to share, this is something I kind of share a lot, but it's a, a photo. Um, when I used to go to work, I used to see signs like this a lot. And I think for the most part, we've seen signs like this. Uh, saving up for a blanket tonight to sleep at the bus stop. Anything helps, even a dime. Um, so I put this here just as a way to be reflective that what we are trying to do is to grow a network and you know, hopefully the largest coalition of young people trying to do something about homelessness. Like, we might all have different careers, different interests, but the point is that we can come together, do our part, share our skills um, so that we can make a difference in people's lives. Um, and I think for me, that's one of the best parts about being in this organization, especially as someone who's been in it for so long. Um, I don't directly work with people anymore, but as in people who are clients, but I work directly with all of you. Um, and so, you know, this is, this is our mission. And you know, I think this is a very, very noble one. Um, but those are those are just a few of my my thoughts. But yeah, you know, I appreciate everyone being here today. If anybody has any, if anyone needs to reach out to anyone, please do. Um, that's everything from me. Thank you, folks. Cool, awesome. Thank you so much, Martin, for sharing um, with the rest. And in the spirit of you wanting to take photos, I was wondering if we could uh, take a quick photo of everybody. Um, if you have your camera on. I'd really appreciate it if you could turn on real quick. Alrighty, I'm giving you guys 10 seconds to get ready for a photo. All right, five, four, three, two, one. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. Um, and that's pretty much it for this year's collab, guys. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you to all the different chapters. I know that chapters right now are in different parts of their growth, some more established than others. Um, but the whole message with this is that we got to move together. Um, we got to move as a unit. That is kind of the only way that MSP will have uh, longevity is if we keep moving forward as a unit, as one. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming. If you ever need anything, you can always reach out to me, reach out to anyone in MSP. We are here for you uh, with anything. Does it have to do with MSP? It has to do with life, career goals, anything at all, advice on anything, uh, the next shoes that you want to get, anything. Please reach out. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Have a good Saturday, everybody.